I didn't learn my lesson the first time. There's a lesson to be learned here. I don't think I'm ever gonna learn. All right, let's talk about the second episode of Star Trek Picard. I'm still not on board with the intro visuals wise, but the music is actually growing on me quite a bit. Here's the thing about episode two. I'm still hooked, which honestly is not hard to hook me because again, I grew up with the next generation with my dad, even though I do like Star Wars more than Star Trek. And it's it's hard not to love Picard because obviously he's the, the best captain and, and nobody can disagree with that statement. At least anyone that any of us would take seriously, of course. And I guess before I get into spoilers, why is everybody so angry in modern Star Trek? I mean, we're led to believe that Earth is a place free of poverty, disease, and people work just not for money and to live, but actually doing their passions. You know, a, a really boring place. So why is everyone so angry? So I'm going to be talking spoilers for this episode. If you haven't watched this episode, I would say do so. It's not as good as the first episode, but it's still a, it's still a good episode. I still enjoyed it. Much more than trying to watch Discovery. Okay, so spoilers. Man, did they go from a 6 in episode 1 to like a raging 10 boner with all secret society stuffs. I feel like J.J fundamentally change the Star Trek universe where now everything is secret organizations and evil Starfleet and boom, uh, boom. Now granted the Tal Shiar wasn't created by JJ, it's been around in the Star Trek universe for a while, but thanks to JJ we have much more dominant <laughs> Secret societies like Section 31, holy fucking shit. They were there, but they weren't quite so out of control as with what JJ did about 11 years ago. But again, if we want to be extra, extra fair to JJ, I feel like after the next generation and incarnations afterwards of Star Trek has progressively gotten darker and less philosophical and look at this beautiful future we can create and, and more of a everything is fucking awful and everybody's evil and we're all just prejudiced and we hate each other. We get it. We get it. The world's a terrible place. Fuck. Anyways, if you're wondering about the tall Shi'ar it's basically a super intelligence organization in the Romulan Empire that was tasked to secure the Empire from enemies within and without. Their often invisible presence was maybe a little scary and sometimes, much like in Russia where you commit suicide by a uh, gunshot to the back of your head, those that dissented in the Romulan Star Empire would just simply disappear. A comparable organization in Starfleet is Section 31, which used to use some terrible methods to ensure the safety of the United Earth and then Federation. Okay, so I have some questions. Why was Beverly Crusher not the one doing the medical favor for Picard? Are they following the future timeline, the alternate timeline we saw in The Next Generation where her and Picard got married and then divorced? I kind of felt like he learned his lesson from seeing that future and was like, yeah, let's not go down that path. So it, it was kind of weird that we didn't hear anything about her. And if you're wondering about the defect in Picard's brain, it was established back in an episode of The Next Generation, All Good Things, that Picard has a small structural defect in his lobe that would make him more likely to develop a neurological disorder. We actually saw him develop a neurological disorder in an alternate future before that was changed, so I'm assuming the Borg really fucked Picard up with the implant, and regardless of the timeline, he was going to get this neurological disorder. And it also explains his dreams of Data lately. Yeah, he mourns the loss of someone that gave his life for him, but I think it also is to explain why this Picard is a little bit different. Because yeah, you can say, okay, he's quite a bit older than when we saw him in The Next Generation and in the movies. But at the same time, this Picard is a lot more emotional and hostile and them saying oh this neurological disorder would cause angry outbursts these weird ass dreams and stuff like that i feel like it's the writer's way of excusing 
any differences from the Picard we knew. Because honestly, if it was Picard going from 20 years old to 40 years old, you'd be like, oh yeah, you go through a lot of changes. But when we know Picard, he's a he's an older gentleman, you know, 70s to 94, you're not gonna see a shit ton of changes regardless. I mean, we see that in her own world. So I feel like this is the writer's way of saying, hey, if Picard acts in a way that fans believe he wouldn't, it's because he has this neurological disorder and is causing him to act differently. I am interested that Picard didn't want to utilize the loyalty of his crew members to get a ship to find Data's other daughter. Although I'm kind of interested why he didn't at least try to contact Jordy about it, though I am happy Jordy is still alive. Honestly, anyone that Picard mentions from the next generation in the present tense <laughs> makes me really happy because I'm waiting to see who they just gave the chopping block to. But if I was Jordy because I was such good friends with Data, I'd be a little PO'd at Picard. Like, you had no right to keep this from me there was a way to bring Data back or at least defend one of his children. Oh, Picard going to Starfleet headquarters. That receptionist 100% knew who Picard was, but was being an asshole towards him simply because of what Picard said during that interview and basically saying Starfleet wasn't Starfleet anymore and they're basically just criminals and dishonorable. So that definitely was a way for that guy to be like, oh, who are you? Oh, hey. Welcome to see you up and about, sir. I mean, look at Picard's face at the receptionist. He's like, go fuck yourself. Admiral Clancy's hissy fit? Wow, the fucking hubris. Again, everybody is so angry in every Star Trek show, modern Star Trek show. Why is everybody so angry? I get why she would be a bit frustrated, but at the same time, that dude has done so much for Starfleet. Although I guess you could, there's a lot of stuff that might be questionable about Picard. He did a lot for Starfleet. It is interesting that we're getting more of a reason for the Federation being prejudiced, which was very disappointing. But again, everything just has to be dark and depressing nowadays because cynicism is in. Do you guys remember when being random used to be in and it was just the, the height of hilarity and a lot of shows use that type of humor or, or set up and I complained about it. I complained about it nonstop. Obviously I wasn't on YouTube when that sort of thing was in. I wish to God being random was back in because this whole dark, gritty cynicism that we're doing, it's like, okay, we get it. The world's a shitty place. Can we at least in Star Trek where you're supposed to be hopeful about the future and humanity and us reaching out to other species, can we at least have that? Is that okay? If I want realism and people just being terrible, I'll watch Star Wars because that realistically shows what would be happening in a galaxy. People just being absolutely terrible. Star Trek, I want a little more uplifting about the future and us getting over our prejudice and, and coming together. And we just can't have that anymore for whatever reason. Oh, I know the reason because being nihilistic is the in thing right now. Nothing matters and being edgy is just the only thing I feel like people care about anymore. And I know people are still saying, oh, it being dark and gritty and not having a happy ending subverts our expectations. It really doesn't, asshole. Subverting our expectations nowadays is people doing the right thing or someone actually being happy with their life or uh, presenting a good marriage on television. It's, it's just, it's gotten to the point where it's like, I'm just gonna stick with books because Shows are just so one note, everything is dark and angry and terrible. So anyways, a bunch of species would have left the Federation and collapsed if they didn't stop aiding the Romulans. And I mean, I get it, the Romulans suck, they caused a lot of problems, but they also helped quite a bit. And we had evidence that that was being patched up. And I know Patrick Stewart said in interviews, this isn't the same Federation from the next generation, but holy shit. So the Federation is going to let people bully them into who they do and do not help? You realize acting like spoiled children that don't know how to share their toys is the opposite of the Federation, right? And Starfleet being folded into that organization should have similar goals.
I say, but I guess again, section 31. If you're wondering about this lady, it was his old first officer, which is part of the Countdown Picard comic, which I'm not saying I read because I took a break from reading comics and to admit I actually read these would make me a hypocrite, which we know I never am. So obviously this is the beginning of his team and we saw in previews the rest of his team. Oh, hey, here's not a shock. <laughs> Narek is a bad guy and working for the secret, super secret Romulan society to get close to Soji. Nobody saw that coming. Although I love how much of a drama queen they make the Romulans. So I was talking about everything has to be realistic and gritty and you can't be over the top cartoony villains anymore. Those just don't work like they did. Even I'd say in the 90s. They were pretty prevalent in the 90s. So I like that they have these drama queen Romulans that are just so intense. Absolutely hilarious. I'm 100% down for this. Soji is definitely growing on me. I wasn't too into Daj, but Soji for sure. I feel like I like her a lot more. She's definitely a lot more empathetic. Um, I guess both the twins should theoretically be identical but then again we get into the nurture versus nature debate so I would be interested I mean I guess we can't do this anymore to see how similar they were and how they view the world and how they think I would assume that they think the same but again the the nurture thing even though they did grow up in the same family since they deviated and went different routes it would be cool Although they are only three years old, aren't they? Hmm. And actually, speaking of the them only being three years old, basically, I have really liked um, in other, I guess, stories. And I really enjoyed in episode one when Dej is talking about growing up and her memories with her family. And Jean-Luc goes, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful memory. And it's yours. Like, regardless, even if it was fabricated, it's real to you. And I personally, I don't know if this is you, I like discussions about AI. And even if you program that memory in something, so even if we want to talk about Westworld and the hosts, it's still their memory. Even if it was manufactured, it's still theirs. And... But Card saying in episode one, it's 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 a beautiful memory. And regardless of what you find out about yourself, it's still yours, even if it was created for you to have. Because this is gonna get a little bit debatable here, but even with children, let's say I have kids, I don't. I am giving them memories by doing things with them. So in a way, how can we say something is artificial versus something is, is, is real? And I enjoy those debates between artificial intelligence, artificial memories, and real people, real memories and all that. And I think that gets more so, I enjoy the psychological aspect of it. I understand a lot of people are into more of the philosophical element of it. I'm not so much into philosophy. I prefer psychology. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting argument to have. So if Data's daughters were created, are they real? They they have consciousness. They're apparently sentient. So do they deserve the same rights as any other species? Especially any other species that's part of the Federation. They have such a, a variety. So to say, oh, you're artificial intelligence, so you don't deserve any rights, kind of sucks and it was actually it bothered me on mars when you had some people treating the synthetics like they weren't people and they were just machines and being cruel to them and then the one woman that was sticking up for the machine when we had the the flashback to the mars destruction and the ai going crazy the synthetics she stood up for them, but then she made the comment of, you know, that thing, that machine, that whatever, could rip us apart because they can rip through metal and all that. 
And it went from this person trying to stick up for any creation to uh, don't fuck with them because if they go rogue, it could be really scary. And that was really disappointing to me. I, I, I really didn't like that. I like the idea of a character being like, okay, yeah, they're synthetics, they were created, but still respect things regardless. Be respectful. But, and I feel like it's a reflection even on us nowadays. And I know it gets a little bit hypocritical because I, for one, say, okay, I understand you take what's currently going on in your world and you put it inside whatever you're creating for a show, which is fine. And I understand that. But everything seems so one note. But with this, I feel like it's more of a showing... Think about how disrespectful we are to things that are inanimate objects or we're disrespectful to property or if you even want to be teenagers and people in their early 20s spray painting and TPing and shit like that or uh, if you've ever seen those mobile library boxes people create, you know, take a book, leave a book, whatever, um, and then seeing them just absolutely fucking destroyed. With, for people that just don't care. And I just, that's a huge problem we have in our world. And I would hope by the time we're in the Star Trek universe that people would be more respectful of objects. But it seems like, okay, even if you have something that isn't necessarily a house or a, a mobile library. You have something that is basically AI, it's, it's a machine, you're still being cruel to it and not respectful. And it's just, it's weird. It's kind of like sending this message that we're just never gonna get past it. We're just, we're always just gonna be selfish, terrible assholes. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of tired of that message. I'm kind of tired of the message that humans are always going to be awful. And I know it's more than humans in the Star Trek universe. There's other species. But it's just like this this all-consuming message that we're just always going to be awful. And we're never going to evolve past it. And it's like... Okay. Cool. So we know we're getting a second season of Picard. Are we going to end this series with Picard dying because of his neurological condition? Because I kind of feel that's where they're going. I'm already sad. Oh, and there was one thing that was way too on the nose this episode when Picard went, I never understood science fiction. And I get it was a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You're the main character in a highly successful science fiction franchise. <laughs> no. There was some humor in this episode I really appreciated, though, such as on the Borg Cube, this many days without assimilation, I thought was really adorable and kind of that dark humor that gets a, a giggle or two out of me. As for Technobabble, I know uh, you guys made some comments about it, how it's a little extreme in Picard, and it was a little more prevalent, I think, in episode two, but Star Trek's always had Technobabble. It's... Uh, if you ever read the interviews with Patrick Stewart, at first he was a little frustrated with the, the fucking, the techno battle, and he's like, what the fuck am I saying? So, I, that doesn't bother me too much. Um, when the shows get basic science wrong, yeah, it can be a little bothersome, but, I don't know, I kind I kind of let those things go, honestly. I don't let them bother me too much. Usually. That being said, I do have a Science versus Game of Thrones video, but even in that, I'm acknowledging it's a fantasy series, so... At the end of the day, who gives a fuck? Was it me, or did uh, those siblings seem to have a very, I don't know, sexual relationship? Like, I got some sexual tension vibes off them. Maybe I'm way into Game of Thrones with the incest stuff, but... I, at first, I was like, ooh, they're, they're lovers, but then when she went little brother, I was like, oh. Oh? I don't know. I have a feeling that she has had sex with him, and not the other way around. 
Okay, so those are my thoughts on the second episode of Picard. I'm sure I have many more thoughts, but I'm trying to keep these reviews to under 20 minutes. So like, subscribe, and let me know in the comment section down below how much Star Wars stuff I have on this set. And how fucking dare I talk about Star Wars.